Yeah. So thank you. Uh, it's great to be here with, with all of you. I heard you had some fantastic workshops yesterday, and there were some important speaks today. And of course, when you have Amazon and Booking and you have all of these important speaks, you will think, what is this guy going to tell us? But I'm here because we pay the money. So, <laughs> but okay, fine. Maybe we have as well something to share. Let, let's see. I think there is a, quite a few things. And as well, I couldn't help myself but change the title of the presentation. So we'll be talking about a few things. So we started, so what, who is Raiffeisen Bank? Raiffeisen Bank was a startup. So this bank started like 20 years ago in an apartment. Five people getting together, and they are the only bank in the market which they made it forth without buying another bank. So this is a bank which grew naturally. And how do, did they grow? By being brave, by being bold, by taking decisions, and that worked out in this market. So they launched the first mobile banking, the first internet banking, and then we got a bit too big, so you would say a bit too fat. And then we come back to that initial set and we say we want to be that bank again. And we started a couple of years ago. And we started with this gentleman. Uh, he says that uh, teams can produce products which is a copy of themselves. Boring team, boring product. Bureaucratic team, Boring product again. <laughs> I think it goes to boring for all of this. So. so, and we said, so how does a bank which grew from being a startup to being a 2,000 people company go back and designs product as we did 20 years ago by changing ourselves? So this was the initial assessment. When the board got together and they say, how do we do it? Can a boring organization produce good products? Absolutely not. And maybe I'll give you an example. Because that law works not only in organizations, it works, uh, in my view, across industries and even, uh, and even states. And there is this example from this small, I would say, country, which you recognize from the Middle Ages, Venice. And Venice maybe was the first venture capitalist state, or, or the Silicon Valley of the past. Let's, let's call it that, because I think it, it, it's fair to call it that. These guys had this brilliant idea to, and they call it a cologanza, when a smart, young, motivated risk taker would collaborate with an older, richer person, they would share uh, the, the investment and they both could get rich. And the, and the risk taker would go around the world, come back, and a lot of new rich people were being born. Until, at some point in time, the elite says, you know why? We don't like so many faces getting rich, so let's get some control into this. And they approved one law called La Serata, and after that, everything went south. It's the only time in the human history, which I know about, that the country degrades itself without being invaded or without anything happening to them. And I believe the same happens to all teams and organizations. Coming from that story, so how many organizations and systems look yeah. So you have a big boss, and you have a smaller boss, and even a smaller, and a smaller, and a smaller, and then you have everybody who does. And what does it do? Every layer filters, and every layer creates, uh, creates a mistrust, and, and you pay a price. And the same is with systems. There's a funny story about that uh, start word there, where I was sending an email to all IT a, a couple of weeks ago. I do it not as much as I like, but this time I did made a typo. In instead of writing shift, I write that. I think this is the email which was read by most people ever. So now I will make sure that every time I do some typo in the future. So going forward, I just wanted to make a point with this. So there is a law. For you to do a better job, you must be a better organization. So what did we decide? So we said, just by changing this a little bit, it's not going to work out. So it was new teams. We decided on a new open source architecture. We decided of a new way of working. So there was a lot of new, 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 new in that sense. And I'm talking. This is an organization which was a classical bank. How did that work out? So 
what did we want to address? All of these layers, all of these filters, they create pretty boring products. We needed to remove them because we needed to remove the friction. First in our collaboration, first in our architecture, then that would articulate in our products. And it's about integration. When I say integration, I mean you have to integrate people with partners, employees, customer, technology, information flows, feedback loops, things which you heard today by many speakers. So it's not only about IT integration, it's about organizational integration. It's about getting your team in the middle of everything, getting them first-hand information. So, may, just one example, what do we mean by, by, by integration? So, there are many ideas have been around for a long time, like the wheel and the suitcase, and the, but only 50 years ago, this, and I showed this slide before, I like it very much, because it proves a point. There's many research to that. They say, rarely innovation is about new things, but it's about watching the world and your customers and the needs with a different perspective. So, and we call that uh, innovation integrators. Many big companies have them, and they, like Pixar, for example, and they say that these people have one characteristic. They are a bit humble because they know the innovation is basically about copying. It's really combining. And with all these filters in the organization, from the big boss to everything, if you are structured like that, this integration suffers. There is no flow. Your people in call center, they know best what your customers are suffering from. If that information doesn't make it to the board which allocates the money, the project which you hoped about will never get approved. Yeah, I hope, I hope this is for me just an entry of why we did what we did, because this was a conversation we were having at the beginning. And we talked as well, and these slides are taken from our SEEK strategy. So it's not something done for this presentation. It's what was shown to the board. So would you say this is the future of the digital experience? Can I see some hands? Who believes that's the future of digital experience? No hands. Great. It's a good crowd. And then we showed this. And this was a talk with the board that says, what about we show you a different picture? It's a bit like Dolat, but I think it's much bigger because it's Marrakesh. Yeah, and in this picture, if you focus, you can see this lady here. And this, she does that for a long time and she sells bags. What she does, focus on her. She observes, she understands. So if a young man, like I used to be, wants to impress a young lady, he buys the bag for 10 times the price. She personalizes the offer, she does that everything, effort that he can have a joke, so it's a good experience, fully integrated. And we believe technology and companies must create experience on that level of integration. So if technology is too late, if your CRM engine comes the next week by saying to you that Enkelet needed, uh, I don't know, an Android phone, I'm not an Apple person, Android phone, one month ago it's too late. If you know that I need a product and you, and you tell me too much, it's as well not natural. So the experience should be in that level. So integrating all of your capabilities, information, organization that you are able to address the customers at the same time. Just one summary of the first part of the presentation. Integration with your employees, with your feedback loops, and who, where these are starting, in your branch, call center, digital channels, ATMs, partners, vendors, designers, academics, you name it, cross industry, these create different value networks. And the value next co comes from the book uh, Innovator Dilemma. So you can reinvent your business model. By having bureaucratic organizations, that information flow is stopped and you get less and less of that organization. So, what did we do? So it's good, yeah, nice talk, good philosophy, but really what was behind? So what, we, what did we really invest our energy into? 
And I want to start with this. There, there was a time in, how many here are technology people? Can I, can I see some? I'm alone, I guess. <laughs> then I'll be much faster. <clears throat> there was a time in IT, you come in and as a student and you find this box. The box can be from IBM, from NEC, from whatever big vendor. And usually there is a certain relationship developing there. And you fell in love and you become an expert and basically you retire with that. So that time is not there anymore. So first we decided, so we set up teams, cross-functional teams. This was, I just put some statistics for one year. They crunched around 400 user stories, which had some real value, which were broken down with 949 tasks. All done on top of some open source technology and there are 30 plus. Now imagine a company which worked box relationship going to 30 technologies without an owner. You don't have somebody to, to complain about. There was a statement a saying in IT uh, in the past that say nobody's fired for buying IBM. I don't think that's true anymore. So there's a radical change. And we agree that we want to go in a direction of being cloud native. It's not so much about Amazon and Azure and Google and all of this stuff. It's about getting your being free. This is how our technology stack looks today. You can ask questions later, so if you want to ask. And then we made another decision. So how do you come to this uh, Marrakesh level experience, if you remember that, integration? All the fancy names of the architects are there. You have your microservices and your Kubernetes and your touch points and your SIG strategy and your etc. But you need to be on top of your data. And there are some very interesting developments in that area. Started from LinkedIn with their Kafka product and then going around with Alipay and ING and Uber and the rest. And we decided, of course, a bank in Croatia maybe doesn't have the weight, but we have the same needs. And these technologies are open for everyone. And we made a, a decision that the fast data architecture is the backbone of how we want to articulate data. Maybe that's the right word to use. How, on real-time manner, you can react to events, execute models, and take action. So this is the second component. So first component, teams, cross-functional, agile. Second component, open source architecture, 30 plus technology. Third component, based on real-time stringing. Yeah, I don't want to talk much about it, but this is how it basically looks. So on the left, the red thing is the legacy. And don't understand me wrong, there's nothing wrong with legacy, because there's a, be a lot of talk about legacy. Legacy is that, and it's bad, and it's evil, and etc. But legacy pays, pays your lunch. Legacy is what's making most of the company profit across the board. So we don't hate our legacy, we respect it, but we want to decommission it. So it's a quite respectful relationship in that sense, but still we are decoupling it and putting it in the new architecture. And it comes to, so you have all of this data flying around and you have all of this microservice and all of these services which are growing and then you say, how do I show this? Because of course you can have the best thing in the world but you need to show it to the world. And then we made another decision. This is where we are, most of our systems. Then we understood that this was our next idea. So let's decouple the front end on top of the microservice and then we say, you know what? It's getting a bit in the middle, so teams are, are, are in, the, in, the, in the road of each other and it's not working as we hoped it would work. So we said, let's go micro frontends. Here, sorry, micro frontends. Which means we made another decision to build small front, front ends for each of the microservices, working on the same SIG strategy on top of this fast data architecture on top of open source technology stack. Yeah, and, it, and it's growing. So it was started with one of this year, but it's growing. Every two weeks, our teams are deploying. Every two weeks, you have code, new code going. Every two weeks. And I made some statistics. These are coming from SonarCube, our measurement. Last year, we deployed 15 times per day in our development. Is this uh, Google or, or 
booking maturity far away. We are like a small toddler because these companies deploy hundreds of times a day in production. But still, for a company used to have these boxes stretching to go to the extreme and the same people, we, did, we brought some partners, but mainly these are the same people. The same people which took that on themselves and stretch that in parallel of doing their daily job, learn the new stuff, get in a new way of working, and deliver. And this is what happened. We deployed like 12 times a month in production, so to the customers. Our ambition, and this is completely achievable, is to go higher maturity. How do you go higher maturity? You go higher maturity by increasing tests and increasing uh, your tool set, so you can go faster, for go from developer to customer, if you increase maturity. When we wake up in the morning, there are trouble, I'll talk about challenges a bit later. So there are 2,000 challenges. Don't, don't understand my, my, my talk that we, it's, a, it's a happy and uh, a walk in the park. And it's a, no, it's far from it. There are every day's issues, but we wake up and we talk, and small step at a time, we get it a bit better. Yeah. So our ambition? from developer to pro production immediately. Yeah, of course. I, I don't want to, to, to bore you with uh, nitty-gritty details. There are a lot of things behind. There's a lot of de development. You need tools. You need automatic testing. You need integration tests. You need a way of working. You need how your product owner makes decisions. And very good talk uh, from the biases. Thank you for that talk, because it's completely correct. Bankers design products for bankers. Architects build buildings for architects. That's why you see these beautiful, totally unoperatable buildings around. So you need to get better. You need to get better feedback loops. You need to be humble. Understand that what you believe will happen in the future most probably will not. Take small risks. Assure survival. So meaning if you have a disaster in production, that might mean uh, not assuring so and spin it every day. And this is our way. You cannot even copy it, because it's your way. It develops in a certain way. Yeah. I'm surprisingly faster than predicted. And we come to a very important component of this. So <coughs> and this was a slide from an internal training we did for in IT, an internal, uh, we called it IT Academy. And we started by asking the question, do you think what is more important, the land or the, or the, or the what is that, the seed? Can I, can I see some hands? Who believes the land is more important? Who believes, okay, one, two, the seed? I don't know, there's a lot of undecided people here. <laughs> uh, either this is so boring you are sleeping, or it just, uh, let's try it once again. So who believes the seed is the, and the land? The land, yeah, great. I believe the land is as well. I believe that an environment can either articulate, can either accelerate or can amplify your potential or can tone it down. For the same reason, it would be difficult to imagine that Mozart was born in North Korea or Steve Jobs in some other parts of the world. I think that the environment you create around your team is very important. And we started to talk, how do we want to open this conversation? Even if we are a bank, so people need very simple talk, especially in the decision-making layer, layer. Remember that car to understand what we are talking about. And we said, fine, let's put two examples out there. One example is uh, Dynamo Zagreb, and the second is Real Madrid. What does Dynamo? They grow their talent. They create an environment that you are becoming better and better. So it's an environment, it's a pipeline. And they are fine. Some of them go to Real Madrid, some of them go to wherever. Someone tried to convince me to put Hajduk there, but I didn't accept. I didn't want to cause a political problem. So, so what do we do for our, for our team? Because as we said, remember that law. He says, bad communication structure, bad products. So whatever you do, however you pay, Forget it. It will be boring as hell. 
these are some of the things we know by now, but this might evolve, and that's, uh, they are evolving by the day. So we have a, a new way of working. These agile teams help you break all of these layers. So they help integrate customer, business, product, technology, designers in one room. Conferences like this one, speakers we are inviting in-house, and we do it quite regularly now. We changed how we sit. We use new tools. We had a lot of people joining the team in the past uh, year and a half. And as well, talk around the company that this is not about business IT, designer, product, product owner, scrum master. It's more about integration. It's about creating one team which acts like one company which can do a change with their feedback loops within a bigger establishment. And the bigger, and there's a key part here, uh, the bigger establishment needs to learn to keep its hands away. So we are learned in corporates that if it works, can I maybe jump in and help here and there? Please don't. And I tell this to myself as well. <laughs> so I'm not. Yeah. Teams. To the initial assumption, how do you create the communication structures that the team gets excited and they own the product? Everything else basically fails. Technology doesn't matter. These 30 are today, another 30 will be in, 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 in 10 years or in two years. But the team must own the responsibility of evolving themselves, the technology stack, not to get in a relationship with a box being at IBM or so, and retire with it. The challenges. Trust. Trust. Trust creates a lot of friction. The lack of trust. The management, the business, IT, risk, customer, they have no clue. They are idiots. These guys, I'm BSs. Yeah, this kind of state, they kill collaboration, they kill integration. You cannot produce good products. Technology sh stack should not be taken lightly. Of course, it was a quite a shock for us as an organization to go from a far left to a far in, in this open source and from having somebody to blame and say, it's not my fault, boss, sorry, it was, uh, I don't know, Oracle who failed. Now you have nobody to blame. It's all, all on you. And there is complexity there. So I'm not saying it's easy. It's complexity. And it requires a lot of support from the entire organization. If your CEO doesn't understand it, it most probably won't gonna fly. Coming to that bias, IT people build systems for IT people. We want to impress each other in conferences. Yeah, that's in human nature. I want to look cool here and say, look how good things I did. Yeah, but that's not the point. And maybe I, I quote one of our CEOs, one of most talented in the group. He said when he was asked, what do you, your 1,800 IT people do? He answered, they do business. So IT people do business. They don't do IT. They don't do risk. People do not do risk. Designers do not do design. They do business. They understand customers, and they want to have an impact. In big corporates, this boxed thinking, this I want to impress my peer kind of creates a lot of damage. I am IT. I don't want to talk now, because when you need technology, I will talk. But Hello, gentlemen, you are as well a human being, a father, a mother, a brother. So perhaps you know a thing or two about other things. Because in your free life, you cannot stop talking about everything. How to manage Dynamo, how to manage Zagreb, how to manage the bank. So we know much more than our role. But sometimes we put ourselves in this small box. Yeah. Now I come to a... I have another five minutes, so it's okay. How many of you know what PSD2 is? Okay. 
The PSD2 is, I think, the biggest thing that happens to banks in the last years. It was a regulation which opened up banks. So we had one of the reasons we went to that extreme is that we need to open up our ecosystem through APIs. The talented people like yourself can use banks as part of the network. Just let me make an example. Maybe you want to do an uh, app or a solution or whatever you want to do for the small business in Croatia, and you want to connect the honey producers with the cookie producers and with the restaurants. You can use our APIs to send payments to create a richer ecosystem. Less friction point to the customer, less friction point to the citizen, less friction point to the person using it on the other side. And this is already available as of September. So whoever from you wants to use it can basically use it today. We want, many banks are, are scared of that. They say, uh, no, now all these uh, young, talented people and fintechs will come and steal our customers. We in Relifies and believe it differently. We believe in this integration, which I'm talking about. We believe that by combining banks, customers, people, and, and, and your talent, we can build maybe better value streams. So we can expand the market. So having said that, I will share my email later on. Who wants to get trained on this topic and who wants to know how to do it in practice? And it's quite simple. Please uh, show some interest. And we will train you. So we will train you how to use the bank as a service and be independent from banks. Is there any interest as of now? Can I see some hands? If somebody would be interested to join that. Five to seven people I can buy beer, so it's quite easy. I thought much more, so that's it. Thanks for that. And that's basically it. So thank you for listening to me, and it was a pleasure. <laughs>